heart, God. Thank you how your Holy Spirit moves amongst us as a body to just, uh, Lord, do what you want us to do collectively, individually, however that may be. And so, God, we just uh, commit that into your hands. Thank you, Father, that we can just use uh, the joy and the fun that we're going to have as well, Lord, to minister to others. What an extra added blessing, even, even greater blessing, Lord, as always. More blessed to give than to receive. We love you, Lord. Bless your word right now, God, as it goes forth in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in Ephesians 5. I'm going to turn there. <clears throat> Sorry, Brian. Josiah, whoever. Okay, we'll pick up at verse 15 of chapter 5 of Ephesians. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, as I mentioned uh, last time, when Paul says there in verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, that's the seventh and final time that he incorporates this idea of walking a spiritual walk into the instruction he's giving here. That's not just random. That is uh, uh, how Paul has been developing his instruction for us as believers and for us as a church body. A seventh and final time he's wrapping that up, this passage here that we're studying through last time, now here and on into this. This passage actually ties all of these previous allusions to walking in the spirit, walking as believers spiritually, and ties all that up together here. That concept of a, a Christian having a spiritual walk with the Lord that can become, it really should become, ingrained in my thinking, that that is the way I live, dude. I don't live for this world. I have a walk with the Lord. That's how I as a believer should be because it is a doctrinal theme that runs throughout the Bible. The Lord Jesus spoke to his followers as walking in the light, he said, and Peter warns against walking after the flesh. The Apostle John, he says that he has great joy to hear that those he discipled are walking in truth. And many other examples, if you, you know, keep your radar up, if you're going through the New Testament, you'll see that continually because that is... I'm supposed to be living. The unbelieving world has no such walk, at least, you know, that they are aware of. Before I was saved, I didn't realize that I was walking in futility of mind and just wasting my time here on earth. As chapter 4, verse 17 says I was, I didn't realize I was walking according to the course of this world, that I was walking just as Satan dictated. That's what I was doing, according to chapter 2. That's what the world does. It's his world, and he dictates, he points people, and he runs the place presently. He's usurping the authority of the Lord Jesus, but Lord willing, not for long. Now, you know, I, personally, I didn't realize that that's how I was. I was just living life, dude. That's just how I lived. But in hindsight, with eyes wide open now, I realized that that was exactly the state I was in. Before I was born again, the only walking I ever did was physical. And I read an article this week of how dangerous even that is becoming for people just to walk in a, in a world physically. This article was stating how close to 1,200 people were treated in hospitals across the country just over the last 12 months, a little less than 12 months, who sustained serious injuries by doing nothing more than walking. That is a, the statistic that has quadrupled over the last several years since people walk around staring at a little box in their hand. They told in this article of a 24-year-old woman who walked right into a telephone pole while texting, ended up in the hospital. A 28-year-old man who walked off the edge of a steep ditch while he was talking on his cell phone walked right off a cliff. 
A 12-year-old boy was hospitalized after he was clipped by a pickup truck because he was playing his video game as he walked across the street. A bicyclist was on his cell phone, not paying attention, ran down a 67-year-old woman, put her in the hospital. The best one, you know, is a guy from California, of course, you know, who was texting his boss when he almost walked right into a 400-pound black bear. Thankfully, he looked up. He was two feet away from the thing. The injuries he incurred running away weren't as bad as what would have happened if he would have just walked right into this beast, you know. Well, well, well over a thousand incidents were reported, this article went on to say. Doctors believe the actual number is significantly more. <laughs> All kinds of people are coming in. They just don't want to say how stupid they are. And I just walked into a pole, man, because I'm staring at this box. But that's where, you know, the world has gotten. So there's a need just in the physical realm to walk circumspectly and not as fools, as verse 15 says. But as a believer, I've been given a new set of spiritual eyes. I've been given a new set of spiritual feet to walk in or not walk in. You know, so I have the ability now, if I'm truly saved, to walk on a whole different plane to navigate life here on planet Earth from a whole new perspective. It's a perspective, Paul's been saying, that only comes through God placing his Holy Spirit within me. When, it came, when I came to faith in Jesus Christ, was born again, the Holy Spirit enlightened me at that point to what is really true. When he has come, Jesus promised in John 16, 13, when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will guide you into all truth. See, truth can only be given to me. You can't learn truth. You can learn knowledge. You can learn information. But truth can only be given from God alone. And it can only be given, eternal truth, can only be given to those who are born again. That's why Paul now, in concluding this point in verse 18, as he has exhorted believers to see to it that we're walking circumspectly, not like fools, not unwise, verse 15, like the world walks, we're to be redeeming the time that we have been given here on earth, verse 16, by understanding what the Lord's will is, verse 17. All of that is only going to take place he now says in verse 18, by being continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Having my life, you know, continually filled with the Holy Spirit's influence and guidance is the idea. That understanding that that is the idea that comes by way of the contrast that he draws in verse 18. When he says, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. It's a very interesting way of introducing. This is an essential doctrine here. It wouldn't take a couple weeks just breaking this down. It's a very interesting way of introducing it and not to be missed. The contrast presented in verse 18 is not between wine and the Holy Spirit. The contrast, you'll notice, is between the effect that each can have on a person, specifically a believer who comes under the influence of either of those. It's like how people will get pulled over by the cops for driving erratically. They'll end up being charged with a DUI. You're driving under the influence. In other words, according to the police, the person wasn't in control. The alcohol was. They were filled with wine or some other intoxicant to where it was directing their behavior. They were under its influence. That's what Paul's speaking of here. Now, normally... Unless someone is just walking down the street, minding their own business, and a person comes and accosts them and holds them down and starts pouring wine down their throat or Jack Daniels or 20 Budweiser's, you know, unless that happens and they become helplessly under the influence of, you know, a booze, which, you know, is probably pretty rare, I would imagine. But normally, if I'm under the influence of some substance, it's something I subjected myself to. And so the contrast here entails a purposeful submitting of my will to something or someone else. Most people, you know, you know them, you look around. Dude, even during a Bible study, they'll just look at their iPhone then. They're submitted to no one but themselves. And one day they'll stand before God and they'll say, you know, surprise, you know, it's not all about you. You are not the center of the universe. God is. 
But a lot of people want to wait till that day. To be drunk with wine under the influence of alcohol here, as he says in verse 18, it brings dissipation. It's not a word usually people use every day. And there's a technical definition for dissipation, but it's best described by someone who has personally experienced it. This is a quote from an online conversation between people complaining about the consequences of their operating a motor vehicle while under the influence of alcohol, in which is dissipation. One person posted, I got a DUI and now I owe the court $2,800 and I have to take classes that cost $1,700. I lost my job, I got a new low paying job and I have to walk to work. That's an example of dissipation. That's what comes with, you know, just putting substances into myself. And dissipation results when people give themselves over to alcohol's influence, whatever, drug or whatever, dissipation like that can manifest itself in many different ways. Oh man, I'm pregnant. Not me personally, but that's what, you know. <laughs> Some woman can find out, you know, ended up in a fight, man, or ended up crashing my car. Basically, it is behavior that is without any sensibility that leads to ruin. Now, according to historians, drunkenness was epidemic throughout the Roman Empire in cities like Ephesus. That's why Paul brings this verse in here like this. Not that things have changed. They just didn't have cannabis and opioids and cocaine and crystal meth and LSD and ecstasy and whatever else is contributing to drug overdose being the number one cause of unnatural death in our country today. That epidemic is relatively new and is just an in indicative of the moral condition of our nation. That's where our nation is at, dude, just sliding down a bunch of drug-induced drunks. Not that many of these drugs didn't exist then, they did. But, you know, they're epidemics in our nation. The United States has actually sought to combat substance abuse on a national level ever since this country was founded. You won't learn that in public school. We've had a couple great awakenings dude, where alcohol was gone. A hundred years ago, this nation was just entering into something called prohibition, where for a whole decade, alcohol was illegal in the whole country due to the, the, the efforts of those overzealous Christians. They're always pushing their views on everybody. At the time of prohibition, alcohol was recognized as the leading contributor to destruction of marriages and families, as well as being the cause of large numbers of work-related accidents, injuries, and deaths in this growing industrial age. A lot of dis dissipation going on. People are just like, well, duh, you know, I don't think this is really good for us. <laughs> Maybe we should get rid of this stuff. You know, and, but up until 1966, there were still areas of the United States where alcohol was illegal. You wouldn't even think of that today. Prohibition is referred to now as a joke. It's a failed experiment. It's smirked at. As a sale of alcohol in our country today generates over $250 billion a year. To put that in perspective, the entire movie industry generates around $50 billion. The entire music industry makes about 45 billion. Video games make about 43 billion. Legalized cannabis is at 15 billion a year and growing rapidly. If you wanna invest in the world, dude, look at all the CBD places that are opening up. Oh, but it, you know, it's fine and everything on big pot leaves, you understand, dude, that is the step into legalized cannabis <laughs> to tell you if you're one of those people pushing that on people. You better check your heart with the Lord. Legal opioids, con con the consumption of opioids brings about 78 billion. These are just, you know, legal. Because with alcohol raking in over $250 billion a year, with over half of that goes to the government, of course, the federal, state, and local levels, obviously very lucrative enterprise for, for the government. Drunkenness and the dissipation it brings has been around since the time of Noah. Genesis chapter 9. 
But secular historians record how every major culture from Egypt to China, Mesopotamia, Inca, Persian, Greek, Roman, even Israel, you read about it in the Bible, have all dealt with alcohol epidemics. In the countries leading up to the time of Christ, the massive amounts of acreage that were given over to vineyards in Europe and the Middle East forced rural migration into urban centers as more and more land was needed for producing wine to meet consumption in the demands in cities like Ephesus. As I mentioned before, Ephesus is a leading commercial seaport. They had huge pagan festivals, man, they had all, all kinds of idolat idolatrous worship. It was all fueled by alcohol. That's why when Paul picks this up in verse 18, he says, don't be drunk with wine. It's stated almost as an offhand remark. You'd think he's talking to the church. Well, of course, that's, but he's, he's talking to a society that was just epidemic in alcohol. The introduction of Christianity with, into Ephesus with its provision for a non-destructive alternative, such as being filled with the Holy Spirit, that was revolutionary. I mean, that, wow, there's something else to life than just drunken entertainment? Yeah, man, it, it's called, you know, Jesus Christ in the gospel and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul is telling the Ephesians, exchange a way of life that is filled with wine for a way of life that is filled with the Holy Spirit. The verb filled is in present passive tense, which means it is to be an ongoing condition that I am subjecting myself to. Literally, it is be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a very crucial doctrine to understand with regards to the relationship that I as a believer have with the Holy Spirit. Now turn back to chapter 1. There's all kinds of weird behavior that being attributed to the Holy Spirit these days that is not biblical. That's why we just go through the Bible. Let the Bible speak for itself. We're going to learn this is what being filled with the Spirit is. It's not the stuff you're seeing on TV and people write books about. It's let the Bible tell us what it is. Very important to understand the Word of God. It says in chapter 1, verse 13, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the pur purchased possession to the praise is honored. Upon salvation, the Bible says, I was past tense sealed with the Holy Spirit by God the Father. It doesn't say be being sealed with the Holy Spirit or be sealed with the Holy Spirit because that was something done for me that I could never achieve nor could ever merit on my own. My relationship with God as my Father by adoption through the sacrificial atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, that relationship has been sealed, the Bible says, through this gift of the Holy Spirit. How thankful I am. My salvation is not dependent upon me. It's dependent upon God. 2 Corinthians 1.21 says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and who has anointed us is God who has sealed us given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee to be sealed speaks of permanent ownership upon my request God doesn't just say you got to do this but I asked God sealed my relationship with him by giving me the spirit in my heart first Corinthians 1 says which speaks of a second aspect of the relationship that I have with the Holy Spirit, his indwelling presence. I will pray the Father, Jesus told his disciples, John 14, 16, he shall give you another comforter who will abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world can't receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. So the sealing of the Holy Spirit is not just some abstract philosophical you know, concept. It refers to a permanent personal presence 
of God the Holy Spirit living within a born-again believer. That's the definition of being born again. The Holy Spirit's presence within me is what produces a new nature that I didn't have before. All of a sudden, I find myself desiring holiness like we were singing. I didn't desire that. I desired sin. Now, all of a sudden, I desire holiness. I love the Bible. I never wanted to read it. I tried, and I couldn't even understand it. I'm depending upon prayer now, and I'm seeking fellowship with other born-again Christians. That is all due to the Holy Spirit who lives within me now. If that does not describe your life, then it would be best to question, dude, am I, is the Holy Spirit even living in me? You know, I mean, I go into prisons, and it's the first thing I talk to. These guys sitting there, they look like they got an attitude, and they're just sitting, yeah, do whatever, you know. I said, dude, if you don't like, like I always say, if you don't like praising God in the Bible, then, dude, live for Satan, because you'd hate heaven. That's all they do there. You get people's attention at that point. All of a sudden they say, well, it's not that I just, dude, God's not playing games. You're playing Satan's game. And the Holy Spirit lives within me. I desire holiness. I love the Bible. I depend on prayer, dude. It's my life's blood. I seek fellowship, and I don't care if people, oh, you go to church two times a week. No, dude, I go to church every day if it's open. I got to be there. If you were sick with some disease, you'd go to the hospital. You wouldn't say, dude, what, why, you go to the hospital twice a week? Yeah, dude, I got to go and get my treatment, dude. You know, well, I got to be around Christians because when I'm around the world, I start acting like the world. They start rubbing off on me if I'm by myself. So I get around Christians, I get built up, and then I go back out as a warrior for Christ, which Paul is going to show us how to do that later on in this epistle. Now, because the Holy Spirit is himself eternal, due to that, the new nature that resides within me that I have been sealed with is also eternal. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus said in John 10. I know them. They follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. What a promise. And so at conversion, I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit as he comes to live within me. Eternal life has been given to me through God's free gift. It is a permanent, abiding, life-changing relationship that I have with God through the Holy Spirit and that he has with me, all of which is not dependent upon me. It is by grace through faith, not by ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And now I get to chapter 5 of Ephesians. You have this sealing and indwelling of God's spirit, but now I get to Ephesians 5.18, and I'm told, be, Jeff, you be being filled with the Holy Spirit, as opposed to how someone would be being filled with wine, is the contrast, to the point of becoming completely under its influence. Be filled with the Holy Spirit to the point of coming completely under his influence over my life, I'm told. And so this aspect of my relationship with the Holy Spirit is dependent upon me. I'm not being told here of what has happened to me. I'm being told what I am to do in light of what has happened to me, in light of what has taken place in my life. If I already have the Holy Spirit living in me, he is a personal entity who has taken up residence within me, not in part, but in full. You can't just have a little part of the Holy Spirit. But it is with him that I may or may not enjoy an overflowing relationship of his divine power, love, joy, and peace, depending upon how much I am availing myself to the influence he desires to have over me. The full, all the fullness of joy peace that surpasses understanding. You know the scriptures. God's power over, uh, for victory over my sin, man, he's given me all of that. I, I, that and many other things are all available to me. The New Testament says they are all things that the Holy Spirit is waiting and desires to produce in my life, but he's not going to control me like a robot. 
and he's not going to manipulate me like Satan does to do his bidding. All these spiritual blessings and more are available to me as someone who has been sealed, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but they will only be experienced through my being filled with the Spirit, giving myself over to his influence over my life, which is described in three primary ways here. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit, he says, speaking to one another, verse 19, in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. These three things are describing what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. These are three evidences you want to know if someone's filled with the Spirit, you know, they're going to tell you, well, if they speak in tongues, blah, blah, blah. Biblically, this is the description. You want to know if someone's filled with the Spirit? It did. Are they singing praise songs? Is that what's coming out of there? Are they thankful for everything? Dude, are they submitted and to proper authority, or are they the boss in everything? And they're going to take it, dude, because if they are, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They're not, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. They're filled with themselves. A joy within manifested in praise to God, thankfulness to God for all things, not just a few. He strikes me with some illness. God, then I need an illness. I don't know why, but I'm not living for this world. If you want to take me home, I'm ready, man. I can't wait, you know. <laughs> Maybe you want to cling to this and you know, keep your carcass going as, as much as you can, dude. Too bad for you. I can't wait to be with the Lord, you know. <laughs> You want to give me an illness, then you're going to get me through it by your grace. And it's going to be a witness to those around me. Because I'm thankful, God, for everything. And I'm submitted to proper authority. Submitted properly. How this, is, how this goes down. I don't know about you, but before I got saved, those things were not evident in my life. You know, they, they were birthed in me. When the Holy Spirit took up residence within me, before that, I never had a desire to sing praises to God. I didn't walk around, you know, hey, did you get the new Hillsong album or whatever? <laughs> I didn't know any praise songs. I could have cared less. I'm listening to Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden, you know, <laughs> that's, that's who I'm worshiping. I didn't have a desire to praise God as is described in verse 19. I do now. That's all I want to do. And I, I pity people who sit there on their hands because they're so ashamed that they don't want to lift their hands and just praise God with everything they want. Too bad, dude. Jesus hung naked on the cross for our sins. All I want to do is praise you, Lord. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what God has done in me through the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit. He ignited that within me. I didn't go well, one day think I'm going to do this. The idea here is that I can choose to give myself over to this new desire that has been birthed within me to sing hymns and spiritual songs, make melody in my heart to the Lord. I can choose to give myself over to that, to that new nature I have or not. It's up to you. You can live a miserable life as well as a Christian. Many do. But see, to the extent that I do, that will be the extent to which I will be being filled with the Holy Spirit and his influence over my life because that is what he desires to foster and grow and encourage in my life as a born-again believer. Not out of, out of his own relationship with me, but the Holy Spirit has been sent to facilitate my relationship with my Lord Jesus Christ. If I am his, this is what Jesus desires of me as his follower. He has, he has faithfully seen to it that we have divine power. No one's going to be able to stand before him and go, well, I couldn't do that. I put divine power within you to do it if you wanted to. Is faithfully given divine power, made that available to carry out our relationship with him. He's done everything on his part. He said in, to his disciples in John 16, when the spirit of truth has come, he will get, lead you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority. 
but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, Jesus said. The Holy Spirit isn't here to glorify himself. He's here to glorify Jesus, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you, John 16, 14. See, the Holy Spirit hasn't been sent to encourage and grow me in the things of the world or of the flesh. So if that is what I continue to give myself over to, I will not see any fruit of the Holy Spirit in my life. I'll see the fruit of ruined lives and destruction, health, whatever it may be. But he has birthed in me, if I'm born again, dude, he has birthed in me a heart of praise to God. And I know he has. There was, there was a thankfulness birthed in me at conversion as well. I don't know about you, there was a thankfulness I didn't have before either. A thankfulness to God for his grace and mercy in my life, a gratitude to this day for this gift of eternal life. You know, man, how can I not be grateful? I'm going to heaven, man, by what he's done for me. My salvation has been secured for me as a thankfulness, and along with that, inward desire to sing praises, give thanks to God for his gracious gifts. A desire has been birthed within me to serve others, to take the lower place if necessary, to submit to others, willingly submit, not push myself to the top all the time and have to boast and brag. These are all things that do not come naturally. Maybe they do for you. They didn't for me. That is the total opposite is what defined my life. So people are like, what happened to you, dude? You're a completely opposite person. That's right. The old person died, and there's a new nature living in me. These are all things that do not come naturally. They come to me supernaturally. And according to this, these are evidences that a person is filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, you listen to some people, you watch others on so-called Christian TV. I wouldn't recommend it. Just read your Bible, you know, and so you can dis discern what people are pumping out there these days. Jesus said the deception is going to be rampant. And the deception is so rampant in the church right now, it's amazing. Just read your Bible. Don't take my word for it, dude. I'm nobody. Let this be your authority. But you listen to people, dude, and they, you know, you think, you know, that the Holy Spirit's just around doing all these weird things. It's, it's, those in Christian circles will only point to some charismatic experience or a dramatic outward expression like speaking in tongues or some other physical expression, which I don't want to discount anything God wants to do through a manifestation of his Holy Spirit. I don't discount the gift of tongues. I've speak, spoken in tongues, and I've heard people speak in tongues. But, you know, when people come up and their whole arguments about tongues, I hold up that one page in the Bible. That's as much as God devotes to that topic. That's how important he feels it is. Dude, if it's your whole world, I would read the rest of the Bible because that is not God's emphasis. His emphasis is on love and on serving other people. And I don't want to discount anything, but I'm going to test all things by the word of God and hold fast to what is true personally. The way that this is presented here, Paul exhorts the believer to be filled with the Spirit, giving three examples of that in verses 19 through 21 with an expanded explanation then of the third example, submitting to one another because, you know, giving thanks to God in all things, that's pretty obvious. Singing hymns and making melody, yeah, do you live in a musical at your house, however you want to do that, but submitting to one another, how does that work? Because everyone, you can't have everyone submitting to one another. <laughs> no, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. You'd be there all day, you know? <laughs> And so Paul, from verse 21 through on into chapter 6, he breaks that one point down several ways. This is how that works. He has an expanded explanation of that third point, the specific evidence of being filled with the Spirit. So seeing as this doctrine, and we're going to have communion, as being filled with the Spirit is too important to try and exegete 
in one Bible study, introduce it, and we will break it down and get more into it next time, unless you want to wait here till 4 o'clock. I could go on all day if you'd like, but we don't have that time. You're probably thinking, please don't, okay? But we'll pick up with this, study it more in depth next time, so uh, make, to make sure there's no confusion here, we're going to celebrate communion. Brian, you're going to lead us in communion, bro? All right, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, for putting your Holy Spirit within us, empowering me, God, to live for you, because, God, I don't have any power on my own. I'm a failure. Everything I do by my flesh and of my own works, God, is pretty, uh, pretty depressing to look at. And so, God, I just would pray that your Holy Spirit would fill me just take over my life, Lord. Consume my heart, Lord. I know you're not going to open your, your, my head and just pour your Bible into it, God. But, Lord, direct my motivations of my heart. As David said, let the words of my lips and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Not just my outward actions, but my motives, God. And the meditation that you see, you see past the actions, God. May that within me change that God because Lord that's where the rebellion starts and that's where the action come follows so please God work within Lord at that point by your Holy Spirit thank you God that he is ready and willing to put to death the deeds of the flesh to crucify them every day as I if I will hand them over and God I pray Lord that by his power and he would remind me continually of your word God and I could just hand those over thought by thought all day long if necessary, God. You do it, Lord, because I can't, and you're faithful, God. You've already done everything, and so, Lord, praise you. So we give you all glory. So we celebrate communion today, God. May we as a body of believers, Lord, celebrate together this precious gift you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.
chains wipe away every stain. I'm not who I used to be because I don't have to be the old man inside of me. This day is long that it because I got a new name, a new life. God, 